Okay, I'm just going to go through the ecology notes here so you can uh, take some notes and be able to fill out some worksheets to help you to remember this sort of stuff. So uh, ecology is the study of life and its interaction with other life and its interaction with the environment. Different from human biology, where we study what ha happens inside of humans, um, and different from the biology of different animals and plants as individuals and what happens inside of them. It's kind of what we've done so far uh, this year, but now we're really looking at how different individuals interact with other individuals. And so when we talk about this, we talk about living and non-living things, living things uh, and things that come from life are called biotic factors. So plants, animals, fungi, anything from the kingdoms uh, and anything that only comes from living things such as uh, feces would be an example of a biotic factor or the living uh, part of soil or the part of soil that comes from life. And then abiotic factors are the non-living things that are there regardless of life, such as uh, carbon dioxide, water, etc. cetera. Um, here's some, a nice list of some different biotic and abiotic components of an ecosystem. And I will let you read that on your own instead of me just reading through it. So um, up to this point in the year, we've talked about pretty much everything up to uh, an organism. We've talked about cells extensively, tissues, organs, organ systems, organelles, molecules of life. And now we're going to be addressing uh, the largest blocks of organization of life. Uh, so an organism is one individual, could be multicellular or unicellular, uh, and it can live on its own. Anything smaller than that cannot live on its own. Uh, a population is all the members of one species in an area. So if you think of your town, for example, uh, you could talk about the population of humans, or you could talk about the population of maple trees, you could talk about the population of squirrels. So when you talk about population, you're only talking about one species in an area. Uh, community is all the species in the area. So when you talk about the pop, the community of your town in terms of biology, it includes the trees, the grass, the, all the bacteria, fungi, humans, um, all the different animals, birds, etc. So all that stuff combined is called a community, but it doesn't include does not include non-living things. When you get to the ecosystem level, this is where it becomes much more interesting. At the ecosystem level, now you're talking about two big differences from communities. One is that it includes biotic and abiotic factors. And when you talk about an ecosystem, you're talking about the system, which means how things interact with each other. So how do different living things interact with each other? And how do living things interact with the abiotic environment that surrounds them? A biome is a group of ecosystems with very similar characteristics. Uh, and these biomes are defined by uh, the plant cover where they are or lack thereof. And they're determined by the abiotic limiting factors such as sunlight, temperature, water availability, um, that sort of nutrient availability. So examples of biomes include tropical rainforest, uh, deciduous forest, uh, desert, um, grasslands, taiga. So you'll take a closer look at biomes in another uh, activity. And then finally, the biosphere is the region of a planet, in our case, the Earth, where life exists. Uh, so it's all life on that planet and the zone that it exists in. So I want you to take a minute and pause this and see if you can organize these groups from least to most complex. And when you think you've got that, check with your neighbor, go on to the next slide. So now we're going to look at the complexity of ecosystems. And I'm going to zip through uh, the first few slides here because I think that it's largely a review for you. And that is that uh, producers are the ones that capture energy to get energy going for an ecosystem. Without producers, you would not have an ecosystem. So they capture energy and store it in food molecules to be used in life processes such as plants. Uh, or in this case, this deep sea vent on this slide, uh, they're using sulfur minerals that are coming out of the uh, sea floor and uh, bacteria and other organisms are using those sulfur molecules to build food molecules. 
So in the case of plants, we call it photosynthesis, where you're capturing the sun's energy. We, we've studied that. And in the case of these other um, deep sea creatures, we're talking about chemosynthesis, where no sunlight is needed. Instead, they're breaking down uh, or molecules that are coming from these deep sea vents. Uh, we've talked about this, primary consumers, secondary consumers, uh, uh, scavengers. There's two types of secondary consumers. They are scavengers, which eat food that's already been killed. I think this is what you are for the most part, unless you hunt or fish for food. You go to the grocery store and scavenge. And predators are things that kill what they eat. Um, interestingly, most predators are also scavengers. So we think of like bald eagles and lions as being these noble predators. But the reality is, is if they come across food that's already been uh, killed, they'll, they'll help themselves to it. And then an omnivore is another type of secondary consumer that eats, kind of acts, I guess, as both, as both a secondary consumer and a primary consumer because it both eats producers, which are plants, and it eats consumers, which are other uh, animals. And then finally, a super important role in the ecosystem is decomposers. Imagine if we didn't have decomposers and imagine that every year the leaves fall off the trees or you mow your lawn week after week and you have all this dead plant matter and there's no decomposers to break it down. It wouldn't take long before the earth was just piled up with dead matter. So the decomposers play a critical role and they include bacteria and insects and other invertebrates that typically live in or on the soil and break down uh, dead things to recycle the materials that and allow the ecosystem to keep going without decomposers you wouldn't have a cycle in your ecosystem uh, we've made food webs before but i just want to illustrate and, and reiterate that uh, the arrows on the food web show energy flow so the energy captured by the producers and the arrow shows how the energy goes to the tadpole. Some people make the mistake of drawing the arrow from the tadpole to the algae because the tadpole eats the algae, but the tadpole doesn't give its energy to the algae, it's vice versa. All right, so why don't you take a minute in your notebook and draw a food web of this ecosystem here and also draw an energy pyramid or biomass pyramid of the same ecosystem and in your biomass pyramid uh, remember to put your producers on the bottom level and then your primary consumers and secondary consumers etc here is a nice example of a energy pyramid or biomass pyramid you want to be able to answer those last two questions there which we've talked about in class You want to be able to answer this question. These questions are good to go over with your table partner. Another good question for you to answer with your table partner. You can pause it. All right, so you'll spend time working on biomes and another activity. And All right, so let's talk about a habitat versus a niche. Uh, a habitat is where an organism lives. So let's use a black bear, for example. A black bear's habitat may be in the woods, in meadows, um, of a temperate defor deciduous forest biome. Um, its niche, however, is its role in the ecosystem. So the black bear, it's, it's not just about where it lives when you talk about niche, it's what it does. So what do black bears do? Uh, they eat berries. Uh, and other plants, and in doing so, they will uh, poop out the seeds from those berries and spread the seeds in other places. Uh, they dig holes, uh, which allows for primary succession to occur. Um, they're going to be scavengers, so they'll eat um, any bits of dead animals and that sort of stuff that they find around, so they will help break down and recycle nutrients. Um, they drink water. They uh, will dig into bee um, hives to get their honey. So a black bear has lots of roles that have ripple effects through the ecosystem. And that is its niche habitat where they live. Niche, uh, is not only where it lives, but also what it does in the ecosystem. So 
So we've talked uh, extensively about predator prey and uh, dynamic equilibrium and how uh, in a typical ecosystem, if you have a carrying capacity line such as across here, then the predator and prey populations will oscillate around that line. We've drawn that graph a few times. Uh, as the prey increases, prey population increases, the predator population will increase, which causes the prey population to go down, and then the predators don't have food, so their population goes down and this goes on. Let's talk a little bit about competition. So, and you can have competition, uh, as when, competition happens when two organisms or two populations are uh, both trying to get the same resource and there's limited resources. And we've talked about this in terms of evolution, where competition is essential for evolution. You have to have limited resources, otherwise there will be no change in the species. You, there's no reason to have survival of the fittest without competition. So interspecific is when uh, organisms compete with another species, such as plants competing for food or sunlight, plants competing for water. Or you could have um, animal species that are competing for uh, plants or animal species that are competing for prey. Intraspecific is competition within a species. So this is when you see uh, like big horn sheep ramming e their heads into each other and they're competing for mates uh, or birds will compete for mates or, or nesting territories. Um, this is what happens when you have competition within a species or intraspecific competition. Uh, but things aren't always uh, predator prey and things aren't always competitive. Sometimes there's relationships between organisms where uh, one or both of the organisms benefits. Uh, and it's not predator prey, one's not eating the other, but they find some way that they uh, relate to each other otherwise. So here's three examples of that. Mutualism is where both organisms benefit. For example, bees and flowers, the bees get uh, nectar to make their honey and the flowers get uh, their pollen spread to other flowers. So that's clear mutualism. Another one could be commensalism where one species benefits and the other doesn't seem to be affected. And an example of this could be um, uh, when you have barnacles on whales, for example, it doesn't seem like the barnacles, which are those little white crusty organisms that live on the whales. It doesn't seem like the whales are affected by this too much, but the barnacles are dragged through the water at high speeds by the whale. Uh, so they're able to filter plankton out of the water. So that's commensalism. Whale not really affected, but the barnacles are uh, are helped by the relationship. And then the final one is parasitism. And in parasitism, uh, one species, one organism benefits, and the other is hurt. And we have lots of examples of this. Ticks are one. Lyme disease is one. Lyme disease benefits from you. It doesn't eat you, um, but it benefits from you, um, and you're hurt by it. Anybody in insects, uh, tapeworms, uh, athletes, foot, these are all parasites. Um, it's not predator prey, they're not eating you, um, but they are benefiting and you are hurt by the relationship. Um, limiting factors, we've talked about a bit already, but this is the idea that in any ecosystem or biome, that there's something that limits the size of the population. And you can talk about biotic limiting factors, such as the deer might be limited by the number of predators, or the predators may be limited by the number of prey, uh, but really it all boils down to uh, abiotic limiting factors. It all boils down to how much water, soil, habitat, sunlight, minerals, uh, and, and uh, workable temperatures are available. Uh, that's what determines the amount of life that can exist in the ecosystem. Talked about carrying capacity talked about succession. Um, eutrophication uh, is basically succession in a pond or a lake. We've talked about that. And that about wraps it up. Uh, so leave you to fill out your worksheets um, based on these notes as I try to figure out how to close out of the recording.